Hi, my name is Felix Marquez from Orlando Medical Institute. I want to welcome you to this podcast, which is on patient assessment for pediatric patients with the emphasis of pediatric assessment triangle. So a little introduction when we talk about children. Well, we do know that they are different from the adults when we talk about anatomy and physiology, and as well, and as, well as the emotional aspect of children, totally different. So our approach to these patients must be based on their age, and we must accommodate the development and the social issues. As we all know, uh, children, when they have fear or pain, it could hamper the ability to properly assess them. When you have stressed or frightened parents or caregivers, we know that it poses a significant challenge when it comes to assessment and treatment. Children perceive their illnesses and even their injuries differently than as we do as adults. So your approach to these patients must be based on their age and we need to accommodate their unique development as well as their social issues. Um, this is this slide here, as you can see, it's pretty familiar. We all know that we have to put our uh, pediatric patients in the appropriate category. If not, uh, then we're going to struggle to understand the different development, the lifespan of these children. So we know infancy is the first year of life, and we can even break that down. The first 24 hours of life is what we refer to as a newborn. The first 30 days is what we call neonate, and then up to one month after 30 days is what we call an infant. A toddler is from one to three years of age, Preschool age is 3 to 6, as school age is 6 to 12, and then adolescence is uh, 12 to 18 years of age. So when we reference a little bit about the anatomy and physiology and growth of these children, we know that these children grow at a rapid rate. So we must truly understand the physical difference between children and adults, and even infants, toddlers, adolescents and adults, we, we need to identify that and then treat them accordingly and, uh, and put them or place them into that age group. So, like I said, today I want to emphasize, uh, the emphasis of is going to be on the assess, pediatric assessment triangle, which is part of your primary or some people will call it the initial assessment. So as we know in the adult patients, one of the first things we do prior to starting our primary assessment is kind of get a general impression of our patient. Well, this is exactly the same thing. This is the, the way we determine or get a general impression of a pediatric patient. We utilize the pediatric assessment triangle. The cool thing about this, it doesn't require you to touch the patient at all, and this can actually be done within 30 seconds of patient contact or, or visualizing and recognizing who is the patient. And what we do, we're going to base this assessment on three simple things. The appearance of the child, the effort or work of breathing, as well as the circulation. So when we utilize the pediatric assessment triangle, uh, what's awesome is it doesn't require any equipment when we utilize these three steps of the appearance, evaluate the work of breathing, as well as circulation. So... What the first step of the pediatric assessment triangle is we want to evaluate and we want to assess the child's appearance. Uh, often the most important factor is determining the severity of the, of the child's illness and the need to treat as well as how they respond to their treatment. So it's, it's often the most important factor to determine the severity of illness. Uh, it reflects adequacy of ventilation, oxygenation, uh, brain perfusion, uh, maintaining of homeostasis, and, and the functionality of the central nervous system. So when we assess the appearance, we kind of use this mnemonic called tickles. All right, and tickles is, is a mnemonic that is what we like to use to assess the patient's appearance. The most important features of the child's appearance is this right here, which I'm about to go over. So tickles, the T stands for tone. What we want to evaluate is the child's tone. Is the, is, uh, the child moving uh, or upon examination? You know, is it a vigorous response or a very limp response? And then they, do they look lifeless? So how's that muscle tone as you look at this child? Uh, the second thing we want to uh, evaluate is the interact activeness of this child. How active is this child? How is this child interacting to your presence? So how alert is this child is what we want to know. Uh, how 
how is this patient responding to the caregiver? Uh, we're a stranger to this child. So once we walk into this room, especially in, when the kids in need and not feeling good, they're going to lock in on us and say, wow, who is this person? I don't even know who this person is. And they watch you. As you get closer, they start to shy towards their caregiver and look for some type of security. Um, will that child react that way? Uh, will the child act totally different? Uh, do they respond to different things if you put, uh, pull out a, a pen light or you picked up their toy? Or how about if you drop the bag on the floor? Did they recognize that the bag was on the floor and it dropped and made that sound? So sometimes we could do that purposely just to see how uh, inter their interactiveness are they with your presence there? Consola uh, consolability is really important. Can this patient be consolable? And who most likely can console the child is most likely the caregiver, the parent, right? So when they pick this kid up, uh, can they can the parent comfort this kid? Or can you, as a healthcare provider, comfort this kid? If the kid is spoiled, so to speak, and and he just crying because he wants to be picked up. Once you pick them up and you console them and they feel that embrace and that sense of security and they feel that the body temperature starts to rise, they tend to um, calm down a little bit. If a kid is not consolable, then we start thinking, what is going on? This Why is this kid so agitated? There's something medically going on. And we got to investigate to figure out what is the underlying cause of this kid not being consolable. And that's what we want to know. So consolability is good if they're able to be uh, parents can console the kid then that's a good appearance is when they can is when we start to worry the look or the gaze of this kid is this kid staring off into you know la la land are their eyes half open and not even really attentive to you and you could just see that glossy eye uh, that's not a good appearance. And then we look at the speech or crying, you know, depending on the age or age group we're dealing with. But is the kid crying? And if so, is it a whimpery cry or is it a very strong cry? Is he talking very softly? Does this, is his cry or his speech muffled or hoarse? Those are things that we want to evaluate. And all this right here in this uh, mnemonic called tickles, we can actually do this within seconds. Actually, most of the time we already go through all this without even realizing we're evaluating this. So this is just me breaking it down to identify what we exactly want to assess when we reference the appearance of the pediatric assessment triangle. So as you can see right here in this picture that I have here, if you're looking at my presentation, the kid to the left, you can see his eyes are open, very attentive, uh, seems to be in no distress, breathing through his nostril, no nasal flaring, mouth is closed. So this kid appearance looks pretty good uh, compared to the kid next to him where you can see the eyes. He's just really uh, more than halfway shut. Uh, not consolable whatsoever. Uh, his interactiveness is, is not there. Um, so you and I know we didn't get into work of breathing, but you could quickly recognize that we have sternal retraction. So you can see that kid's appearance is not good. So this is a great example of what a good appearance looks like versus a bad appearance. As we move on for the appearance, next thing we want to evaluate is the patient's work of breathing. Very important. We you know, rate is always important. I don't want to say it's not, but at this point in the assessment, we could put it to the back burner uh, and we just want to know, you know, what's the work of breathing? Breathing should always be effortless. So and what do I mean by that is breathing should not draw your attention. Me as a healthcare provider, I walk into a, a, a room or a house where I have a sick child and if his breathing is drawing in my attention, then I'm going to focus on that. That's, that's, a sense that hey something is going on because breathing is effortless i never walk into some a person's house or even at home and talk to my family members or friends and the first thing i think about is their breathing pattern and their work of breathing nobody does that because it's effortless but when it does draw your attention it's drawing in your attention for a reason get grab the bait bite on it figure out why is it drawing your attention and what we want to do is see is do we have any abnormal airway sounds do we hear any snoring snoring is simple guys snoring means that there's the tongue is obstructing partially obstructing the airway that's what snoring respirations give you it's a tongue problem when you ha when you hear muffled or hoarseness of the speech Maybe there's some type of inflammation or swelling that's going on. 
Strider, strider is 100% inflammation around the glottic opening, whether it be subglottic or supraglottic. That whole area is there's some inflammation that's creating the sound of strider. Okay, uh, grunting, grunting comes from the lower part. So that's them trying to <gasps> trying to force get some air all the way down into those into those lungs. Wheezing, we all know wheezing is bronchial spasm, as well as. Um, uh, air moving through a restricted airway, so whether it's bronchial constriction or spasms. I like to tell uh, and teach my students is, don't be so quick to tie in a sound to a disease. Tie in the lung sound to what's actually taking place. So example, why we listen to the lung sounds? To hear air move. So what I wanna know is, is air moving, number one, and number two, what's it moving through? So if air is moving through a very narrow bronchial or a spaz bronchial, I am going to hear the sound of wheezing because that's what air sounds like when it moves through a narrow pathway. You create the wheezing sound. When air moves through fluid, it creates the sound of crackle or rails. So anytime you have fluid in the lungs and air is moving through that fluid, I will hear crackles or rails. Anytime air moves through mucus, we hear the sound of ronchi. So tie the sound into what, you, what is air moving through that's creating that sound. And you'll pick it up all the time. You identify, okay, cool, I got wheezing. I mean, let me, let me use something other than asthma because we know wheezing, we always associate it with asthma. That's pretty easy. But if somebody's having an anaphylactic reaction where they have bronchial constriction or even spazzing, then you expect to hear wheezing because we know air moving through a narrow passageway is going to create the sound of wheezing. We're looking at abnormal posturing. How is this kid posturing? Is he very uh, stiff or rigid? You know, uh, is he tripoding? We all know tripoding is a, a sign of difficulty breathing. Is he is he in a in a, a, a sniffing position, somewhat in a tripod, but also sniffing, pulling his head forward? Uh, that's a sign of trying to get air in. All right, kids refusing to lie down. Uh, those are things that we know is abnormal. We look for retraction, whether it be sternal retraction, intercostal retraction, uh, subclavian retraction. Um, we want to see head bobbing. Head bobbing is, is not a good sign when the head bobs up and down. So you get, if you think about it, the muscles of the neck are designed to keep the head up. That's its primary function. Now, when your kid is having difficulty breathing, those muscles tend to participate to help out with breathing. So they do a secondary job. So if he starts to head bob, which is the primary job of those muscles to keep that head up, if he fails to do that, what makes you think he's not, he won't fail to help out in breathing? So head bobbing is actually a key sign of this kid might be going into respiratory failure. Those muscles are failing to do their primary job, which is to keep the head up. And it's not, it's not going to, if he can't do his primary job, it's definitely not going to do the secondary job of helping out with breathing. So look at that. Nasal flaring. Can you see those in kids? Can you see it in adults? Absolutely. But you could truly see it in these kids. So look at the nostrils. Is it flaring open? Uh, those are things that we want to see. Any abnormal reaction of these characteristics is what we call a work, a increased work of breathing, which is no good. So... Here's uh, two pictures as well that I want to give you. We look at this older kid on, on the left. If you're looking at the picture, you can see he's in a tripod position. So you see he has increased work of breathing. He also has his mouth open. He's breathing from his mouth. Look at the kid, the little kid next to him. You can see he's having a severe, severe trouble breathing. As you can see, sternal retraction. And somewhat, I know it's a dynamic picture, um, a static picture, but if this picture was dynamic and was a, or was a video, you will probably see seesaw breathing where the chest pops out, the belly comes in, the belly goes out, the chest goes in. And those are the abdominal muscles truly trying to help out with, um, with breathing. So look at that. Uh, that nasal flare we talk about, that nasal flaring could be a sign of moderate to se severe hypoxia. So we got to address that. We got to look at that. So as we move on to the, the third part of the pediatric assessment triangle, which is circulation to the skin, we kind of want to determine the adequacy of cardiac output as well as core perfusion. So um, now, once again, we got to figure out what age group we're dealing with, right? Because if we're dealing with uh, probably neonates or very, very small infants, 
it's, they could have some peripheral cyanosis to the fingertips, to the toes that might be normal. All right, so we want to see what we're really looking at. But we put the um, the abnormal circulation. We look for three abnormal things. Is the skin pale? Is it mottled, which is kind of like blotchy red, white skin? Uh, cyanosis. Do you have uh, cyanosis? Is it central? Is it peripheral? Is it both? Right. So that pale skin initially, uh, it's a sign of poor circulation very visible to us to see and it's, it's a clear indication that this kid is probably in compensated shock all right so uh, indicate indicates uh, reflex of peripheral vasoconstriction that the blood is starting to shut away from the peripheral bringing it to the core so that's what's giving us that that pale uh, color skin all right so it is a sign of hypoxia just to let you know it could be a sign of an anemic as well so keep that in mind uh, as we progress and we look at other signs of the skin, we talk about modeling of the skin, modeled skin. Uh, that's that's uh, that's going to demonstrate you know little patchy areas of vasoconstriction, as well as vasodilation as well can determine uh, uh, you can have modeled skin. Cyanosis, as we know, is no good. Is severe hypoxia. Uh, and we want to look: is it just the fingertips? And under the age of two months old, I'm going to say. It's not uncommon to have uh, kind of bluish fingertips or even toes. So we want to focus more on what the core looks like. So we look at the mucosa membrane to see uh, is it truly cyanotic or not, okay? So uh, late findings of cyanosis is going to be respiratory failure and going into shock. So that's what that cyanosis means. So the combination of these three pieces of the pediatric assessment triangle really helps you to estimate the severity of illness when we talk about what is going on with these kids. All right, so we're gonna determine based on this pediatric assessment triangle, hey man, do we load and go or do we stay and play? So, and then we go on to our further assessment, which will be our ABCs, right? A, B, C, D, E, airway, breathing, uh, circulation, uh, assess the disabilities, you know, mental status, reflexes, uh, and then get into the exposure. Expose the patient, take the, the clothes off, see if you see any hidden injuries or any, any other signs that can lead you into that maybe something is going on. Treat those life threat situations, initiate transport. Now, when we get to secondary assessment of the pediatric patient, it's quite, it's quite different than we would assess an adult patient. We'll do more of a detail on the adult. As a pediatric, we do what's called sample. So we'll get into other, look for other signs and symptoms, the allergies, medication, you know, past medical history, last oral in intake, and then the events leading to this episode. That is our secondary assessment. So with that said, I like to sum up this uh, pediatric assessment triangle, the PAT, the PAT with, as if I have a good appearance, my appearance is good, my work of breathing is bad or increased, and my circulation is good, that means the only thing that's abnormal of my assessment triangle is work of breathing, that is respiratory distress. If I have a bad appearance, an increased work of breathing, but good circulation, that's respiratory failure. If all three are bad or I have bad circulation, that is shock. Now, stay tuned to future podcasts about me talking about shocks. But normally what will put a kid into shock is, uh, most common shock is probably hypovolemia. Sepsis is a possibility. Heart rate too slow, heart rate too fast can put a kid into shock. And then anaphylaxis as well. So those are the common ones that we might see with children. Um, others are more common. Um, some are more common than others, all right? So that's a good way to assess your, your pediatric patient. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, quick podcast uh, of about how to utilize the assessment triangle. And I hope if uh, you practice this, you utilize this, you'll get real good at it. And to be honest, you can kind of use this on the adult patient. Well, that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Once again, my name is Felix Marquez. And I look forward to uh, bringing to you uh, further podcasts as we reference pediatric patients.